Grace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust that you've been enjoying the blessings of God on today. Now that we've entered our Advent season, we trust that you have great anticipation and excitement in your hearts as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, as always, please call or text a fellow church member. Let them know that our Bible study is about to begin momentarily. Our text on tonight will begin in Isaiah chapter se chapter 7 verse number 10 through verse number 14 and we'll get to that momentarily also we want to encourage all the parents those of you who have um, children or grandchildren between the ages of four to seven years of age that joseph's donkey zoom will begin this saturday this saturday which is december the 4th 10 o'clock a.m please register your, your sons or daughters or grandchildren on our homepage, woodstreamchurch.org, Joseph's Donkey, uh, so that they will be registered. And this um, Zoom lessons will continue for three Saturdays, December the 4th, the 11th, and the 18th. So I look forward to seeing your sons and daughters and grandchildren between the ages of four and seven for that weekly Christmas Zoom. Well. We ask you to remember to pray for the Wyndham family, for Deacon Patrick, his sisters Gail and Deborah, and, and the like. So please remember the family in prayer. Uh, their dad, Benjamin, went home to be with the Lord. He will be eulogized on next week, uh, on Thursday um, of next week. The, the viewing will take place at 10 o'clock, and then the service to follow at 1030. Please remember that family in prayer. Well, as always, let's give great glory to God by reciting together, glory be to the Father. Let's recite, shall we? Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Well, let's look at our media wall, Isaiah chapter 7, uh, verse number 10 through verse 14. Let's look at uh, what God's word says to us. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Well, of course, this is a beautiful, beautiful text in God's word, of course, um, referring to the eventual birth of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at it first in historical context, and then we're going to make it applicable to our uh, present day uh, circumstance. So tonight we want to take up the lesson of a divided people, a divided people. And I think that all of us can certainly appreciate that reality in our nation as we speak. And so we know that uh, the American public is much divided on so many issues, so much distrust and suspicion and the like all throughout our culture. And so as we look at God's word, we need to understand that this is not something that's new. This is something that we find present in the scriptures. So in the scriptures, we find with Israel that the people were a divided people. They were somewhat divided um, culturally, politically, religiously, and the like. So there is great stress. There's a fracture amongst God's people. And one of the ways that Satan can truly defeat God's people, defeat the church, is when the church is divided. Division, of course, is a tool that Satan uses to weaken the church. So when it comes to God's people, we have to be very shrewd. We have to be discerning that we learn how to walk together in peace and unity and understanding and love and, and so forth, that we not be a divided people. Now, it's very easy to divide people when people are immature, but when people are mature in Christ, 
then you realize, okay, we have to practice forbearance, we have to put our, the needs of others ahead of ourselves, and we humble ourselves to try to come to some understanding to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So what's going on in our text? Okay, well, the first thing is this, is that Israel is divided. So when I say Israel, there is Israel, the northern kingdom. And then there is, quote, Judah, the southern kingdom. So in reality, there should have been just one kingdom of God's people. So we know that Saul was the first king over Israel and he was from the tribe of Benjamin, okay? Following Saul was David. And David was from the tribe of Judah. So under David, the people, the people of God are united under one king. They are united under one king and they are one people. And of course, we know that David would have a son by the name of Solomon. And under Solomon, they are one people. It's only one kingdom under Solomon. But Solomon has a son by the name of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam um, was disobedient. He was not a godly king. And he, if you would, was ambitious. Uh, he had poor advisors, uh, and so under Solomon, Israel was under a tremendous building campaign, uh, building the palace, building the temple. It was the golden age of Israel's history, and Rehoboam uh, should have been wise and discreet to pull back and give the people a breather, but he wanted to tax the people more than ever before, and result, a split took place. And so the split would now consist of the southern kingdom, which is uh, uh, Judah. And now there would be a new emerging kingdom called the northern kingdom, Israel. OK, so when we come here to Isaiah chapter seven, the rift has already taken place. OK, so there are two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. These are brothers. These are Jewish people, but they have rival kingdoms, okay? So what's going to happen here in chapter 7 is that the unthinkable is about to happen. Israel's king, Pekah, and a king from uh, Syria, or Aram of uh, Syria, uh, uh, whose name is Risen, with a Z, Syria and northern Israel plot to attack Judah. Th this, this, this consists of Jews fighting Jews, brother against brother. God's people entering into civil war against each other. It's unthinkable, it's untenable, it's unacceptable to God. And so what's happening is that Judah is frightened out of their minds because it's not just their brother coming against them, but it's their brother in Syria in a confederacy coming against them. And Judah's king, his name is Ahaz. Okay? And the thing about Ahaz, he's scared out of his wits, but though he's the king of the southern kingdom, he's an ungodly king. So with all of that in mind, let's now look at chapter 7 here in Isaiah. We're going to look at verse number 10 and following again, 
and then we can see the dynamics of being a divided people. What does that look like? Okay, so let's go back to verse number 10. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, and so that's the king of the southern kingdom, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. God is saying, I know that you're scared out of your wits. I know the imposing armies against you. You're outnumbered. You're outflanked. Uh, you don't have a chance, if you would. So Ahaz acts a sign of me. Think how gracious and encouraging God is to say, ask of me a sign. Now remember, this is an ungodly king. I mean, this is even showing how gracious God is because theoretically, they shouldn't even be on speaking terms because he's so wicked. But God is speaking to him through the prophet Isaiah. Aren't you glad that God is so merciful that he will still speak to us even when we have been disobedient but in this instance, he speaks through the prophet to Ahaz. Now notice Ahaz's response in verse number 12. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. So Ahaz is sort of begging off. He's saying he's, he, he's had, he has a false piety, a false humility, but he's basically saying, mm, that's nice, but I don't really need that right now. It was insulting that he put God off. Now, people don't realize often through their actions or through their words how they are putting God off. You know, mm, I don't feel like doing church right now. Mm, I don't think I'll, you know, I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like doing that. I'll get back around to that. It's insulting to God. That's the same temperament, attitude that Ahaz had. But God is gracious. And notice what God does here in uh, verse number 13. Then he said, God gives him a sign anyway. Then he said, listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? So stop right there. Isaiah is saying, Ahaz, you don't have a clue how disrespectful, offensive you are towards God, that you are putting God off. Ahaz, you are trying God's patience, okay? You are trying the patience. You, I mean, you, it's your nature. You're just so backslidden for you to try the patience of men, but now you're going to try the patience of God as well. Isaiah is highly upset with Ahaz. Now notice what he says in verse number 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will, be, she will call his name Emmanuel. Boy, you have all this tension. You have a divided people, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, you have a bad king by the name of Ahaz who is insulting and offensive towards God, and yet God gives him a sign. And I think that we can see this in the day and times in which we live. We live during a time in which people are greatly divided, not just in the culture, but, in, but even in the church, if you would. We see people being disrespectful to God, not acknowledging God, putting God off, but God gives a sign. So what we want to do is that we want to look at what is the sign that God gives uh, Ahaz then and to us now. So when we look at this, uh, the sign that God is going to give, what we want to recognize is this, is that Ahaz... Ahaz is of the house of David. When I say he's of the house of David, what I'm saying is that he's of the lineage of David. 
he's of the, uh, with David, the house of David means dynasty, dynastic house of David, okay? So he's within this house of David. So what God is going to, what God is going to say in verse number 14 is this, he's saying, I'm going to give a sign to you in the house of David. He's going to tell us that in the house of David, there shall be a virgin. In other words, the virgin, the virgin will be a descendant of David. The virgin is a descendant of David. The virgin is in the household, will be of the household. Of David okay and what he says to uh, this king Ahaz behold I give you a son a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and shall call his name Emmanuel so in the midst of all that division and all of this um, clamor that's going on God gives a sign and it's a sign of hope. Okay. In the midst of bad kings, bad political leaders, a divided nation, clamor back then and in our day in which we live in, God gives us hope. He is the God of hope. Through all the clamor, all the noise, all the cries, all the division, listen to me, keep your eyes on Jesus. Jesus is the only hope. Ahaz was overwhelmed. He was frightened out of his wits with the prospect of an invasion from Israel and Syria. And guess what God would say? He gives the sign and then God says, oh, Israel and Syria, who are confeder confederated to invade you, God basically says, it ain't happening. He literally says, it's not happening. So let's look at, let's look at uh, verse uh, 15, if you would. Okay, so in verse number 15, we learn that when the child is born, he will eat curds and honey, and at the time he knows, and at the time, he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. Now, it's, this is happening on two levels. What's going to happen is that a child is going to be born uh, in the household there during the time of Ahaz. And, but there is the foreshadowing of the eventual child that's going to be born of the virgin. And, of course, we know that to be Jesus. So let's go to Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse number 23. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. In the midst of division, clamor, God gives us hope, okay? And that hope is Jesus. So let's connect the darts now. So in Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 23, notice how it reads. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being translated means God with us. So when God speaks, God would speak to the immediate circumstance in Ahaz's day. But if you would, God also speaks prophetically centuries later that it would be fulfilled that the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, would be born of this virgin, and that 700 years later. So when we're studying the scriptures, what we have to understand is that God can speak to an immediate uh, circumstance and condition within a certain context, but yet his words can be twofold. They can be addressed to a present circumstance, but it can be prophetic in which what he is speaking may be fulfilled hundreds or a thousand or whatever years after the fact. And so we see how God is gracious to provide us with Jesus. And so one of the, one of the things that we want to see 
is that when God gave the prophecy to Ahaz, Ahaz was wicked. Ahaz was wicked. When Jesus is born, Herod is king. Herod was wicked. Herod was wicked. So you say, well, wh what are you saying, Pastor? Bob? As Christians, don't lose heart when we have leaders that are not godly, when we have leaders who plot against the things of God. For example, life in the womb is sacred, the sanctity of life. And so we as Christians, we esteem life. We revere life, we cherish life. The man has been made in the image and likeness of God. And if you would, abortion is the taking of innocent life. It's the spilling of innocent blood. So we have to stay hopeful. Okay, God, you're in control in the midst of all of this wickedness. And even when we have bad leaders, our hope is in you. Jesus comes during a time in which there is a wicked king and that wicked king is Herod. Don't lose heart. Keep your eyes on Jesus, okay? Isaiah 7, 14, keep your eyes on Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, let's go in our Bibles to, um, to Mark chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 9 through verse number 12. And this is very important because we're going to see the deliberate steps or the actions that Jesus is going to undertake to reunite the clans, the tribes, the people of God. So Jesus, the Messiah, he's coming and he's coming to reunite. The kingdom was divided after Solomon. Rehoboam made foolish decisions regarding taxation. The nation is now split northern and southern. The northern kingdom of the ten tribes of Israel will eventually be defeated and lost. But when Jesus comes, it signifies that he's there to reunite the people. So let's look at Mark chapter 1, uh, and I believe that is verse number 9 through verse 12. Notice what happens here. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Immediately the spirit impelled him, impelled him to go out into the wilderness. Now, here's something that we see is that when it comes to Jesus, God does not send a prophet to speak to Jesus. God speaks directly to his son. So as his son is coming up out of the waters, there's a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, the key to understanding what Jesus is doing here is that the focus, is on, the focus should be on the Jordan, the River Jordan, okay? So this is what we would call the New Exodus. And we're gonna tie it all together to our day in which we live, okay? So when Moses led the people out of Egyptian bondage, um, and they went into the, the wilderness and they were there for 40 years. Moses dies, but Israel has not as of yet entered the promised land. So under Joshua and Caleb, the people cross the Jordan. They cross the Jordan and enter and enter the promised land. The promised land. When they entered the promised land, they entered the promised land as a united people, as one people. Now, 
one people. So with Moses in the wilderness, they had gone up to Mount Sinai. They had entered into the Mosaic Covenant. They became one people under God, one nation under God, if you would. So when they're crossing the Jordan, they are one people. But of course, we know with time that they would become divided into two kingdoms. So when God sends his son, Jesus, Jesus is being baptized at the River Jordan, which signifies the new exodus. So the Jordan in the Old Testament signified the exodus coming to a close, okay? So once they, um, once they crossed the Jordan, the exodus was now over from Egypt to Canaan. So that's the old exodus under Moses. Jesus being baptized in the River Jordan is signifying, hey, it's now a new Jordan, a, a new exodus. Because the people of Israel were baptized unto Moses in the Red Sea. Now Jesus is being baptized at the River Jordan, okay? Signifying a new exodus. And of course, the new exodus, what, what did that consist of? The old exodus consisted of one people, and the new exodus is to consist of one people. So Jesus, doing his ministry, he's going to spend so much of his ministry up in the north, northern Israel. He's going up there so often He's even living up there, Nazareth, the Sea of Galilee. He's up there because that's where the people, the ten lost tribes, that's their former place where, they, where those tribes formerly lived, okay, and were eventually defeated and became lost. Jesus is going up into northern Israel, the new exodus, and he's reuniting the people. How is he reuniting them? He's, he's reuniting them through the gospel. That when people come to him, when they respond to the kingdom of God is at hand, now we're being made one people. So the good news is this. Jesus directed his message towards the Jews to reunite the Jews. But now the gospel message has been extended to you and to me so that when we, if you would, respond positively to the gospel and we receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, we become one people in Christ. And the one people in Christ, the church consists of, listen to me, Jew and Gentile. He's reuniting us into one people through the gospel, and we're being made united in Jesus Christ. So, when there is division in the church, understand this, it is an offense, it is an attack, it is an assault against the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is intended that we be one people in Christ. Therefore, division, fractions, schisms are an attack against the kingdom of God. And it's not of God, it's of the devil who's behind division, okay? So we see here the new exodus, the new realities that we have, that in the midst of division, havoc, and the like, we still have hope in Jesus Christ. And I pray that this lesson in particular is of encouragement to you. There is so much going on in the world with the, vari with the variants regarding coronavirus. And of course, we see the shipping supply uh, crisis uh, all throughout the world. And so the economy, the inflationary cycle that we're now in, and there's so many things that are disarm, uh, dis, dis, disconcerting.
But if we keep our eyes on Jesus, and if we will serve the Lord, and if we remember that God has called us to be one people, then we can rejoice and we can be overcomers and realize that his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. So I trust, keep your eyes on Jesus. Stay hopeful this Advent season. Don't put God off, but rather respond positively to God and give him and render to him the glory that he's worthy to receive. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that you have given us, God, to search the scriptures and to realize that we have hope even during difficult times, times of division, times of danger and peril, Lord, that, God, you are the God of hope. And so, Father, I pray that this Advent season, God, that we would not put your son off or insult your son, but, God, that we would just lavish him with the praise, with devotion that he's worthy of. God, help us not to be slowful. Help us not to look towards to ourselves, but help us to ever look to him. Now, Father, bless your people as we make our pilgrimage to Bethlehem during this Advent season. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, please remember this coming Sunday is the first Sunday of the month of December. We look forward to your worship, 8 o'clock in person, 1045 in person, 945 drive up, and of course our 915 Sunday school. And so we have so much before us and we bless God for his goodness. Also, those of you who are uh, want to purchase poinsettias and of course uh, have a designation of a loving tribute or living memorial uh, this come this uh, Advent season you can do such and designate this and on this Sunday you'll be able to complete a form to purchase poinsettias and also to honor a loved one whether they're living or deceased well let me give the benediction and may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, and may the God of peace go with you. You are dismissed.